Hey everyone, Aria Labs here with the Spending Time Podcast. I am joined once again by David Breden. David, how are you doing today? Good, good. It's all fine. How are you? I uh, I'm okay. We're we you know we had this conversation before the conversation about what the conversation was going to be about, and the conversation is going to be about us communicating with the watch brands. What is it like when we rant? When we go on a rant uh, to a brand. What is that experience like? I think this is sort of part of discussing with the audience a little bit about what it's like to, to be us and, and what we do, what we do. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. One of the most common misconceptions is, this is an ad. Um, no, if you're reading something and you think it's an ad and you're not sure, guess what? Not an ad. Uh, but I think that what's interesting is that we have a lot of feedback we give on a regular basis to brands about the products, ergonomics, design, marketing, pricing. You know, you you name it, we have an opinion on it and we've probably communicated it. And so, you know, you're right now looking at the Seika website um, to sort of discuss, you know, a, a recent kind of rant. And I want to sort of just sort of talk about some of the things we rant to brands about, what are some of the reactions. Um, and in generally, like, you know, what, what our goals are with these rants? What are we trying to accomplish? Which I think is actually quite different than a lot of other watch media. David, what was your latest rant? Well, the latest rant was about Psycho's international communication or like thereof when it comes to new product launches. And basically, I think the first thing that I guess we should make, make clear is that when we rant to a brand and we want them to do better... Um, it's, I don't think it's ever just for our own good. It's, it's for, you know, the betterment for the relationship between the brand and the customer, i.e. you guys well, and the ba- brand. Back up. What would, what would for our own good be? Let's talk about the reasons why we don't rant. Like, what do you, what are you worried about someone potentially, you know, misconstruing? Well, basically, the, the, the only thing, the only reason why I was saying that is because I wrote this article about the new, like, Europe-only limited edition Seikos, which are just new colors, basically. They're nice watches, nevertheless. And I had to go through this experience, which I will try and demonstrate a little bit later, or we can just talk about it. And, and I went on this trend and said, you know, Seiko is a global company, and they totally, totally screw up. They don't even have, basically, communications and PR for new product launches. It's a disaster. No, they don't. It's a total disaster. They don't. It's a total disaster. They yes. don't. They really and don't. The people, and people were like, oh, why are you attacking Psycho? Psycho is the most amazing brand. And I was like, you know, I thought I'd made it clear enough in the article that I'm attacking, so to speak, um, their lack of PR, not the watches, not the products, not the people who make the watches, not the distributors, not the whatever, but just the simple fact of the matter that it's impossible to find out in a qualitative way and with any sort of consistency about new Psycho product launches. And then someone said, well, why don't you write about other watches? And I said, you know, I don't write about other watches because I know and I see that you guys care about Psycho watches. So what was the point of writing about watches that you don't care about? You clearly like Seiko just the way I do, and we want to learn about new products. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that for a new watch, we demand, you know, sort of, we can actually demand that a global corporation reaches out in a systemic manner and says, here you guys, here's like a, a new freaking watch. And so it's just one, one more thing. Someone said, you know, oh, it's just a 500 US dollar watch. And then I did the maths, and it's basically... Over four thousand pieces. These two make up uh, four thousand and thirty. You know what I think pieces. is the problem, David. And hold on. Okay. And yeah, yeah. And um, uh, and basically, this is like if if both of them are around five hundred US dollars, a little bit more actually, that amounts to two million dollar product launch. We are looking at two million dollars worth of gross revenue out of these two products, and I had to go through like a whole bunch of different press sites and psycho sites and whatever, and get these get these pictures from a psycho distributor in Hungary because he had the high resolution files. Nowhere else on the internet, and I say it, I mean it. Nowhere else could I find it, not with targeted Google searches or whatever. And that is how Psycho goes about its two million dollar limited edition collection product launches. How does that work? Well, I think that you just got really spoiled back when they had employees. Oh yeah, maybe that's maybe that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you know, you and I very very frequently and the rest of our team and and for that matter the rest of the watch media as we know it 
They complain to the watch industry about the failure to properly do things that are related to marketing, advertising, and distribution. So the watch industry is still more or less set up like they're producing, they're a wholesaler, meaning they produce products that are that are sent into the market and the market does something with them. The market just sells them somehow, whether it's the retailer, whether the distributor, someone else handles the hard part of getting it in the hands of the consumers. Over the last 10 years or so, for a lot of factors that, that we're not going to get into here, the industry decided, oh no, we want to do a lot of that selling part themselves because they want to retain more of the margin. Also because a lot of things that are not necessarily about greed, but about the fact that traditional distribution models have fallen apart. But they haven't boosted their own teams to have, yes, I know, very low resolution. <laughs> David's pulling up pictures and it's like really low resolution. I get, I get. What, what is this joke? Look, and, 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 you, and you go on it and it's like, ooh, you get this. And I had to like go like this and open this picture. And I was like, well, this looks horribly yellow and it's still low resolution. But maybe if I pull up the other one and put the two next to one another, it will look like something that would look good on a website from 2004. <laughs> it, it is amusing. It is amusing. It is amusing. And I, I... It's not amusing. I stopped being amused. Well, I mean, I think ago. the interesting part is, you know... <laughs> When there's a product release, I think sometimes the audience feels like we're just being handed these things and then like, you know, the, the brand throws a party and gives everyone free yeah. watches and everyone writes about no. it. Like, we have to really chase these stories a lot. And so when we write about something like this and someone's like, that's an ad, all I'm thinking is like, wow, I really wish we were paid for this. <laughs> yes, I so wish. Look, I, I, I'm on psychowatches.com slash global. On the global psycho site, there's the for the media, what, which is called press anywhere else, but it says for the media. So it's that much more difficult to find, but you find it. And then you go to for the media site, and then you can choose between um, Grand Psycho and Psycho uh, for Basel more than anything else, which totally doesn't make sense. And then you open this press release, and there are two shitty little press releases with a total size of 3.9 megabytes for two watches. On the global Seiko press site. So when we go to Seiko and we complain about this, best case scenario, and they've done this, they've been they're pretty you know reasonable. They're like, yeah, it sucks. We don't know, we don't have any other way of doing it. They just sort of throw their arms in there. I mean, look, the the industry is not in a position right now to really su to support you know what we do. But all the little brands out there, or many of the little brands, these little entrepreneurial brands, they have it all down. And it's this interesting transitional phase that we live in. And again, I, I don't want to sound like all we do is just like speak negatively about the traditional watch industry, but their, their level of, of unprofessionalism in a lot of areas is outstanding. Baffling. They still get away with making a very good product. You can still get a really good product, but this is what's interesting now, and, and I was actually having a conversation with someone recently about this. Almost no brand has all good products. So you can't trust brands anymore. It used to be that you could just go and be like, oh, we're going to buy a Seiko because all Seikos are good. No. You have to look, and, and no brand is safe, okay? You can't just buy a watch from a brand. Every brand has, like, all these red herrings. And this is one of my rants. Like, if you go to, like, okay, you're on IWC's website. Like, IWC makes a few good watches and a lot you <laughs> and a lot you probably don't want. Okay, so David is now zooming in on a picture on IWC's homepage that has a giant fingerprint on it. That's a mess. That's funny. I didn't <laughs> That's actually not that hard to see. It's like really dirty. Um yeah. so but yeah, IWC is a, is a is a great example. Like there's some great watches there, but like you can really go wrong buying an IWC. And the consumer consumer knows this. The consumer knows that almost every single watch brand has models you probably want to stay away from. Sir, okay. So like, can you think of any brand right now that every single one of their models is awesome? I'm talking about brands that make more than, like, three watches. No, I can't. Right? It's like they've all bloated their inventories with something that nobody wants. So that's part of my... So your rant is it's really hard to get material to, to write about this stuff unless we constantly travel which we already do and my rant is when are we going to stop making watches that nobody wants 
I mean, does this, does whatever you're saying now on the screen, on, on the on the shared screen, make any sense to you whatsoever? There's Thompson Egerton, who I don't know who she is, next to some watches, and then it's like, it's, and it's just pretty good because there's actual material here. But yeah, to get, yeah. I think, I think we need to take you on a vacation from watch I brands press sites. I need a vacation. Cause that's a that's a road that's a road to nowhere. Okay, right let's there. see Cartier. Cartier is going to be. You me- you remember like you remember when brands would not put up information about their new watches until like months after the shows. Yeah. Now they're a little bit better on it. Like sometimes it's actually during the show. But we we'd go meet with a brand. We'd see a watch. We wouldn't be able to get all the information. We'd miss a price or we'd miss something like that. And we'd want to like write about it, and, like no information anywhere. It's like the it's like the brand doesn't even acknowledge it existed. And then there's certain watches that they sell that are never on their website at all. And this is this can be kind of cool sometimes because you can go into a store, you can literally go into a store, and see a watch from a brand that is just it's not at all even covered on their website, not at all. Bulgari is oh, the yes, is in yes. my opinion right now yes. the absolute worst offender. Oh, such a great idea! I was. <laughs> <laughs> Bulgari has so many watches that have never ever graced the pages of their illustrious <laughs> website. Like go go to the section on Bulgari of, of Haute Horlogerie and there'll be like all of like three watches. I don't know why how they choose those three. <laughs> see at the bottom there it says okay. Let's see how many watches they have here. Okay, let's see Haute Horlogerie. Okay, what do we have? We have a tur- we have a couple of tourbillons. Uh this is so- is that first one even Haute Holagerie, the Finissimo? I, I'm, okay. <laughs> I, I guess. Okay, so you and I know that the amount of Haute Holagerie Bulgari watches is, out, is, is outstanding. There's a bazillion of them. Where on earth did that come from? How did they choose, like, three of them? Yeah, it's... It, it, Okay, so you're going to the website here, and then and then we uh, you're going on a blog to watch. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> look. It, it's hilarious, and you know the the thing that I the takeaway here I think is that we're looking at huge companies with mind bending budgets and mind bending egos a lot of the times, you know who, who mind bending dysfunctionality. Yes, and, and and then they 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 do stuff like this that doesn't make sense. Look, it's what sort of presentation is this of your in-house auto luxury? I'm, I'm, I'm going to like make a disclaimer because I think the audience needs to hear this because they're like, what are these guys talking about? Okay, look, we not are there, watch not there, lovers. Not there. None of these watches are there. Not that. None, none of those watches are there. None of those watches <laughs> are there. <laughs> I just went to our website and found in one one scroll five different watches that are not there. But I guarantee you that we could, without too much trouble, list a hundred watches that Bulgari makes that are not their website. That's the latest one that came out, right there. That that the most complicated watch they've ever made. It just came out not on their website. Walk, walk. Um. But anyways, what I was trying to say is, we are watch collectors and lovers that decided to make our career writing about watches for other people like us. We've never went into what we did because we have any affinity for the watch industry. In any way, shape, or form, yes. we like the product that comes out of it, but I I despise the watch industry. I'll be the first to say it. I utterly despise the watch industry. Um, it's old school. It's frustrating. It's egotistical. It's incompetent. It's all kinds of things. There's some very smart people in the watch industry yes. that kind of, sort of, make it worth it. Yes. But everyone else is just utterly useless. And, and, and again, I probably sound like a curmudgeon saying this, but I ask myself on a regular basis, like, is, is what I'm good at best used on these people? Mm. Like, I'm a collector and enthusiast, and I love these products. I'm completely addicted to them, and I'm happy to admit that. With that said, I don't do this because of my friends in Geneva, and I want to get give like high fives every time like they sell watches. Yeah, I, it's not why we do it. So when we complain about these things, it's kind of like a message to our audience, reminding them the hard work that goes in to producing a lot of this content, and the many conversations that we have with these brands on a regular basis, and the humor which ensues, which is real. 
we are laughing and giggling on a regular yes, basis exactly. between it's when just, we're crying. It's just not so fu- so much fun with spending time with two crying <laughs> men. You know, that's not that wouldn't wouldn't get her a large audience. But here's like a good like a good example. Like I went to Tech Hoyer and I like like the fact that I don't have to log in to find anything. I can just do a search. Everything is in nice chronological order. And this is like a brand that wants to push. You know, that wants to be loud, that wants to be heard, that wants to be covered. They don't make it difficult. And I'm, if I'm working on something and I need like a high resolution picture of like whatever given watch from tech hoyer basically from any era i can even find like vintage watches on here if i look for them um but then it, you're it you're right works. they do a good job and i was gonna say lvmh in general does yes. well except for the fact that bulgari is on my lvmh <laughs> that's a br- <laughs> Well, it has. It, it's all about balances, Ariel. It's 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 like a massive counterbalance for for whatever the heck. So I was I was saying that you know, and I always say this. I like to remind people the watch industry isn't doing that well. I, there's consumer demand is great, but you were looking at those images of Tag Heuer, and I'm seeing like all these faces of people like they don't work at the brand anymore. They don't work at the brand anymore. <laughs> they don't work at the brand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Why is okay, that? So as a, about that. You know, Why is that? Why do people leave the watch industry when I think so many of our, of our listeners, based on just on my on my on myself, when I was getting into watches, I was thinking to myself, working for like Cartier or whatever amazing big brand would be just the end of the world. It would be so amazing. And now I have a I, theory. I have a theory. I have a theory. Yeah. In addition to the whole, they're not treated well and stuff like that. Um. There's a rule of the universe, which is change is constant. You and I are not going to disagree about that. But the watch industry has a very difficult relationship with the idea of change is constant. They don't want to change. And when a watch company persistently doesn't change, I think that very quickly people work there like, nah, I, don't, I need to change. You're not going to change. I'm going to go somewhere else for someone who's changing. It's about adapting to the times. It's about recognizing your weaknesses and wanting to improve them. Um, I see that as being a, as a, as a really big reason. I don't think that the watch industry is, is dynamic or flexible or agile in the way that it absolutely needs to be. I mean, you're making toys for people who want to get excited about something and celebrate something with an expensive luxury. Yes. If you don't create products which feel like they are related to today, you can't get away with that. Now, some brands like Patek Philippe do a good job of holding a image from the past. But there can only be so many brands that create image of the past. Enough of them need to do things for today. Yet, they're unwilling to invest and take risks. Yeah. So all they really know how to Look do is this. be like, this worked in the past. Wow, they made a really amazing Raymond Vile. So we're at Patek Philippe's website right now looking at the it's a nice website. 20-4 automatic. The blandest of bland. <laughs> like Patek Philippe is trying to create like a youth a youth women's like movement for Instagram in a watch that costs many, many dozens of times what a Daniel Wellington costs. Well, hundreds of times actually. Uh if it's two hundred dollars, two hundred times two hundred is forty thousand. How much is? Okay, yeah. Why is this called the twenty-four? Um, because everything is called numbers these days, like the 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 uh, the Tudor fifty-eight, the Washroom fifty. And it's so cool because the word twenty is spelled out, and then there's like uh, it's not even a dash. It's, a it's like the what is that thing called again? I forgot the little wave. So it's no, the word okay. twenty. It it usually means tilde, tilde tilde, and it means approximately. I knew it. I actually use it in that context. I use it as approximately. So it's twenty approximately four. the number four. <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> Which someone in the graphic design department thought was awesome. So this watch has a lovely movement and and youngster ish. That's that's what it's about, and the time is set. 10 to 2, not 10 past 10, apart from this picture, but it is. Well, you know, at the video shoot, they can't, you know, they can't be expected to follow all the rules. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is this, is this the, I, I, I know for a fact that a, uh, a female watch expert that we know was not the biggest fan of this. Good. What's to be a fan of here? 
At the very least. It looks like it's melted. They got the Nautilus hands. You know, they were like, we got to throw a little bit of brand DNA in there. Yes. So let's take the Nautilus hands and the numerals from our pilot watches. How bold. How very bold. Did you notice the ring of diamonds? <laughs> Do you know Ariel? Yes, I have. So before this conversation, everyone, David and I were like, are there any new watches to talk about? Because normally this time of year, which is kind of like, it's not really pre-SIHH, though it is technically pre-SIHH. There was a show in Mexico, SIR, there's Salon QP coming up. There would be new releases in watches uh, that are coming out for us to discuss. And we were like, have you heard of a lot of new watches lately that are worth discussing? We were just sort of like, you know, from across the ocean and shaking our heads. And there was Breitling that was new. There was this Patek. But from big brands, normally, I mean, this period, at the end of the year, is huge. But we've covered that stuff. We've covered that stuff. Okay, so you were in London. Yes. With Breitling uh, for a launch. What, tell, what did they launch? And what do you think about what's going on with Breitling? It's very interesting, really. Um, there's there's ups and downs to it. Um, let me begin with the ups. Uh, this was like this was an event that if you showed Psycho Corporate, they would just have like a heart attack across the board. If there was like twenty people at Psycho Corporate sitting around the table and you would show them like one minute of like footage from this event, they would be like, <gasps> they they couldn't even imagine that a product launch like this could actually ever happen, let alone this many different products. Um, so basically what they did is that they launched, technically relaunched the, the premier collection that used to exist a thousand years ago. And, um, and, and now basically what Kern wants to do is steer Breitling back uh, a little bit more away from this high tech, large, bold, you know, type of Breitling that will still exist. But he realized that basically, and this is what he said, Breitling until now used to be like as though Mercedes was just making the G-Class. You know, it's like a high-tech product for a certain type of clientele. But, you know, Mercedes makes all these other types of, types of product. And Breitling used to make all these other types of watches too. So the Premier is just more relaxed, a little bit more contemporary, um, more uh, casual type of collection. And... Um, basically, they launched a BO1 chronograph. They they launched the regular like washu based chronograph, also day date and an automatic, and a new Bentley for uh, sorry Breitling for Bentley watch, which is just a green. So they version. felt like they were making too many G wagons. They they really and which they were. I mean, if you think about it, like as they were, if they all of their other watches, most of them were oversized and highly technical and whatever, and they just look odd at this time and age. When were they? I mean, don't get me wrong. I felt like that era actually was going away of like you know the it, 47 to 50 millimeter wide one. I you know kind of, anyway, but even on. even last year I could see like. Just last year at Zurich Airport or wherever I was, I could see um, like ads like an icon just got larger. And it was a Navi timer that was like 40 meters wide. It was just ridiculous, like 46 or 48 millimeters or something like that. And I was like, that's totally not the direction you guys should be going. And of course, it they made like a 180 degree turn and, and now they are turning away from that. And the funny thing is I was, I was, I was having a chat with someone for Brailing at the event and we were looking at the Super Ocean and... The previous direction of Breitling sort of knew where to go. They just didn't really, like, they were, I guess, too attached to the old face of Breitling, or they just wanted to take it, like, really Swiss and really easy and really slow on the, on the, on the transformation. And Kern just came, on, came aboard and looked at the Super Ocean, for example, that was basically the first heritage-based new model in a long time because of course you have the Montbrion and you have some others but you know it was a super ocean heritage where there were no wings uh, around the logo for example and it was this heritage based model as the name also suggests and it was before Kern even arrived but now the entire brand is actually going in a direction into which the super ocean heritage really fits in so that's 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 just weird but getting back to the to the premier I was impressed by this launch and the products uh, themselves they look a lot better in the metal than they do on the pictures, which is sometimes takes a better way around. But they here, I think they really do look very good in person. They are a bit pricey. Granted, not a bit. They are quite pricey, like 6200 for a watch you based chrono is, is a lot. But then again, you get, you know, an, an, a new tier of quality. I feel like, don't you feel that sometimes Kern is a little obsessed with positioning? 
Like, he focuses on positioning a little bit more than, like, actual inherent mm. quality. No, I don't... I, like, here, the inherent quality is, is right there. And I think part of the logic was, and this was being said, and uh, <laughs> it, it's not something that they will communicate out in the open, but he said, you know, like, uh, the number of new watch purchases per customer in the in the eight to $10,000 or seven to $10,000 range is much higher than in the in the three to $5,000 range. So somebody who has 4,000 to spend on a watch, they would just buy a watch and then they wear it, wear it for a long time. If, if someone can spend seven to 10 grand on a watch, they would just buy a new one every two years because they have that much more, um, you know, disposable income to spend on watches, generally speaking, of course. But uh, these are, you know, what the statistics that current use showed uh, to him at least so i guess this is also like of course they are free to ask however much they want they are also uh you know uh, reconstructing their distribution um so high discounts i think are quickly going to be a thing of the past in prelings so that also because if this watch was going for like 30 percent off at like four grand not six for the for the watch you raise chrono i would be like well, I understand the six grand because you want to get four for it. But now that you own a lot of the distribution all across the world, it's still going to go for six or five, eight or something like that. So the overall direction is interesting. I certainly appreciate the fact that, you know, Breitling is, is, you know, getting a broader perspective and they do so by looking back at the past of what the brand was doing, but they are not completely relaunching the frigging watches that they made like 50 years ago, like Jager and so many of the others. They look at this idea that, hey, we had a, wa a collection that actually had a brilliant name. I like the premier name because it literally never gets old. And it's a classy name. It, it's, it's, it's a good point. And they figured this it out. It worked really well for Chanel. They, they, well, yeah, and it worked really well for <laughs> probably like 40 years before Chanel. So um, they look at it and they think, like, we figured this out 50 years ago or 40 years ago. So we just look back and do it again because it's going to work. And I genuinely believe that Breitling is going to appeal to people if for no other reason, um, well, not for no other reason, but one of the big reasons is because everyone is so freaking quiet. And when everyone's quiet and you're loud, you're suddenly that much more exponentially, you know, easier to hear. And Breitling with the new, um, new boutique concepts and the new marketing and the squads and whatever, they are really on it. Even at the time when tech, for example, who used to be huge in these things, with Mr. Rivera, you know, having to go away for like a year or so on, on medical leave, things didn't really die down, but, but some sort of like, but the punch isn't really there with Tag Heuer and Duplo in like the recent year. And Breitling is really on it. And I think that's gonna, you know, that's gonna um, put them in a good position really soon. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you're right that Breitling is fortunate right now that the stage is relatively quiet and they get to have a much larger share of voice so while they're not doing that much they do appear to be doing a lot yes. compared to the others who are by comparison very very quiet um and i also like what that you pointed out that they're not just regurgitating old designs while these definitely look more vintage style they're not copying any specific past design and that, that and that was something that that Kerm pointed out specifically that they will not relaunch like when someone asks because they are they are really good friends with this guy who's called Fred something or another uh, shame on me I don't remember I don't want to butcher his his uh, his family name um, you can just look it up because he's been on all these events that Breitling has been doing over the last year and and Kern reached out to this guy and said hey you have this huge collection of all of vintage writings and of course you know them inside out so let's look at how we can work together and the thing what well, something that Kern did not too long ago actually a couple of weeks ago is that he flew in like 10 15 maybe 20 people from like some Breitling collector's board or forum or something just to ask their opinion on on where the brand used to be and they liked about it, where the brand is going these days, and so on. It, it, it's not like they are on the board of Breitling and can make decisions. But Kern reached out to them and threw them in and said, hey guys, you know, let's sit around the table and discuss what you think of Breitling now that you're, you, you know, so, such important collectors. And I, and I was thinking to yeah, myself, like, how is it possible that no one has ever done something like that before? That's insane. Because they never learned what a focus group is. They just missed that day in school. Yeah. Well, it's, it goes back to the egos. They think that they know what's right. Yeah, that's true. Even with us, when they ask our opinion about things, it's almost like the most roundabout way. You know what I mean? What does that mean? Well, it's like they're, 
It's like they want to sneak it into a conversation. Like, rather than basically saying, like, okay, guys, we really want your opinion about this. They're like, we want to show you da-da-da-da. Oh, uh, what do you uh, what do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, almost like it was a side thought. Like, oh, and while we're here, we might as well get your feedback. Did you know that you can get a diamond-studded stainless steel petak Philip these days? That's quite... That's, that's weird. Well, they are aiming for 23-year-olds, and, you know, they do not like diamonds they have or they don't like gold they have plenty of money but they don't want gold that's hilarious it's twenty six thousand and eighty us dollars on prestige time of course this is the steel, steel one steel with, with with tiny little diamonds on it yeah that's that's look it's a patek philippe watch it's gonna be made well you know it's not very pretty it's not at all <laughs> it's so bland it's so unbelievably bland it's it's but the thing is they're like but look at all the other watches that sell and they're super bland what they don't understand is that the bland watches sell between like maybe two hundred dollars maximum okay okay tech it's tech, the, tech the, has got it going for them as well sometimes where comfort and elegance collide <laughs> that sounds violent it's like where comfort and elegance have an accident <laughs> <laughs> okay so the prices here on tag Heuer's website they look like what I think the prices should be on Breitling. That's actually my real issue with what Breitling's doing. I don't. Some of the designs are are simple for me. Um, I like a lot of their watches, like a lot. But some of the new ones are they're just kind of a simple design for me. But they're priced for enthusiasts, and the watch industry really is so stubbornly holding on to the idea that everyone is ready to buy a luxury watch at 18 years old. So in this whole focus on like trying to appeal to younger people, sometimes they do a great job with design. They utterly fail on price. They're so disconnected. Not everybody has rich parents. What? I know, I know. You heard it here first. <laughs> okay? And for all you people out there who are who have rich parents Good and only you. know other people with rich parents, well there's that, but just so you know, you are, you know, uncommon. Yes, good for you. Hold on, let me... And so people who are young and want to buy their first expensive watch don't want to buy one that looks like a not-so-expensive watch. It, it, it looks not that much different to a $3,750 steel tech or your link with diamonds on it. Maybe a few, maybe just a couple fewer diamonds, but at least they are larger. So the current count I mean, isn't... I mean, the bottom line is... Which which has more personality? I mean, Patek Philippe has never been a brand that has been particularly known for asserting personality. But, you know, we're looking at the Tag Heuer Link Quartz for women and the Patek Philippe 20 tilde 4. And honestly, this looks like a more interesting watch. But go to even the Formula One. Or, yeah, no, you know, but, the, but look the at, Lady Aqua Racer. Yeah, I, I mean, of course the Patek is going to be that much, you know, there's a whole lot more work in, in, the, in the Patek than in the Tag. It's 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 obvious it's going to be a higher quality watch, much higher. And they're both going to have really bad resale. Yes. <laughs> well, there's not, not much lower. You can go on a 3,700. You can go to like 1,800 or 2,000 or something like that. But if you buy it for your... For your daughter, or if you're twenty something and you you're you're living a dynamic lifestyle, it's gonna get beaten up anyway. So do you want to beat up like a twenty six thousand dollar watch? I'm just commenting on the fact that compared to men's watches, women's watches don't fare as well in the aftermarket. Women as consumers tend to not be as open to buying pre owned watches and jewelry as men are. It's different psychology. So what I'm saying is with the Patek Philippe, because Patek Philippe no. is like, oh, it's gonna go up in auction, not with the women's watches. Of course not. Not with the women's watches. Actually, go. go you were at, you were at that uh, that gray market site. Go no, there. No, it's gonna be bad. And I want you to compare the price of a Patek Philippe a Patek Philippe women's watch with a quartz movement in it. That's what I want to see. There, oh, there they are. There they are. <laughs> oh boy. It's like ten percent. That's not much. But then it can. Uh, hold on, hold on. Let yeah, me you, hold on. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, why? What? I want to arrange okay, them but by look discount. At, look at these women. So go back up there because you saw that steel one. That's interesting. So go go all the way up there, and just click on one of those. I'm get. Oh, th now now they call that the the. Okay, so that's the tw that's the old twenty four. No, it's twenty dash four Ariel. The new one is twenty tilt four. Oh, okay. So this is like, this watch. It's it's kind of a. It looks very Cartier tank francaise ish 
Um, this this is this is a massive money maker for Patek Philippe because there's huge margins on it. It's a quartz watch. It's steel with some diamonds. Um, retail is is twelve thousand um, bucks. Costs a thousand to make, at most. Y- you know the funny thing is, we've met with Patek Philippe. I don't know how many dozens of times. Have you ever even seen one of those watches in person? No. Not even the ladies who work there. <laughs> they totally don't wear these things. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Like, They're like, nah, I don't want to wear that. <laughs> I like how they have actually say there that the uh, the the movement is composed from 57 parts. I I saw that too. I, I want that, that watch. So you know what funny. I want? That's what I really want. I want a, I want a genuine quartz Patek Philippe for men. If they really want to like go crazy, that's what they should come out with next year. They don't want to go crazy. You, you, you say that as though it was something they wanted to do. They... Of course they don't want to go crazy, but I want Patek Philippe to go crazy. And I'm not just talking about a, th- a three-hand pilot's watch for young, rich people. Duh. I'm talking about quartz. So there you go. The actual the actual cost, cost on one of these 24s in good condition is like nine grand. For nine grand, you can have a diamond-studded Patek Philippe. Yeah, but you know what the thing is, and and I was actually having this conversation earlier today so when it comes to the gray market sites. Yeah. eBay is a website where the price is a real reflection of the intersection of supply and demand. But gray market today increasingly is not that. Gray market is what can we get away with? Yes, that's a good point. Gray market and pre-owned, I'll say that, because it's kind of one and the same. Are we really gonna have to look at your at your local currency? Yes, I no knew I knew you would it. be sensitive to that. That's amazing. <laughs> it's not that. I just have no idea. But what, two million? Huh? <laughs> that's a lot of. I huff. mean, it's like a big number in a in a streetwear brand. It's that's a lot of huff. <laughs> it's a whole lot of huff and puff. <laughs> <laughs> you really have to be careful where you're seeing a comma and where you're seeing a dot. You know because it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah people are gonna see this and be like that's a lot of huff i mean what is that thousand dollars for a piece of paper it, oh wait a minute it is what it is <laughs> anyway uh i think i think it's about time we end this uh, this rambling how, rant how dare you how, th- these are look these are a blog to watch conversations yes this is good sometimes we have a point sometimes we don't um, sometimes we like we want to see what the price is on uh, on on women's uh, Patek Philippe watches. Six grand. You can go as low as six grand on one of these diamond studded Patek Philippe. We are like one of those like old television like shops, you know, where they they keep like bidding downwards on their own shit. <laughs> Look, the thing is this: if you actually want to study what's going on in the watch industry and some of the issues, like all you need to do is pay close attention to what we're talking about. Like what you're actually that demonstrating here is <laughs> no, because think I, about it. look at what yeah. you're doing right now. This is actually quite interesting. You are demonstrating an issue that I've been talking about a lot, and I want to keep talking about, and that is this: once you decide that you want to get a watch, let's say you're a watch buyer and you've decided I want to get this Patek Philippe 24. I'm either a woman or I want to buy it for a woman, whatever it is. Okay, you made the decision. Great. The next step is going to buy it. And before you go into a store, you probably can go online. It's just normally how things are. I mean, very few people are like, I'm just not going to Google it and go straight to the store. No, most people will go online, and even if they end up going to the store, they at least want to know what the prices are. Okay? Yeah. We have seen that there are literally dozens of offers for the same watch at different prices. What this does is make us basically stop in our tracks and be like, wait a minute. Now, the difference between the highest and lowest price of these 24 watches is like, I don't know, maybe about 3000 bucks. It's That's not a, a huge lot. amount in the That's scheme of... That is a lot, but it's not a huge amount in the scheme of price spreads. You know very well that the price spread can be much more for watches around the same price point, okay? Well, it can be like five or six or $7,000 between the highest and the lowest. Well, sorry, we were looking at like... Over ten grand and just under six, and when you look at six to ten, it's almost double. It's like it's like you know. It's well, like the retail's twelve, so that's okay. Okay, you're right. Okay, let's let's say that retail on the watches we're gonna have twelve thousand bucks. The and lowest we saw six. one at is about six. Yeah. So as a consumer, you are stopped dead in your tracks because you're like, wait a minute, if I'm gonna buy this watch, one, I don't want to overpay. Two, I don't seem to have enough information right now to know how to get it. Yes. There's a bunch of different. So we went to a few different websites. 
each of them had at least one ver one of these models available at wildly different price points. So a major issue in the watch industry today is the fact that as a consumer, you have too much variety in the offers such that you don't necessarily trust yourself to make the right choice and you don't make any choice at all. You wait for that like perfect price to come around. And that's normal consumer behavior. I can't get angry at consumers for that, but what's it doing? It's preventing people from buying watches. Yes, exactly. And it's normal. It, it, you know, it doesn't prevent you from buying a car just because, you know, a pre-owned cost of a car is that much lower. But then again, a car is so much more refined now than it was five years ago in a lot of ways. There's so much more high tech in a lot of ways, more efficient. You get more gadgets, you get more comfort, you get more safety, you get, you get better looks and whatever. And when you look at a watch and there's a five year difference and you pay half for a five year old Patek as opposed to a new one in this case, of course, that does not apply to all Pateks, then you really start thinking about, should I just get one that's like five years old and has maybe a few scuffs on it maybe it doesn't even have anything on it and pay half then pay you know for for a new one double essentially or almost well that's double. exactly what everyone's doing and then yeah. what happened as a result of that is every pre-owned dealer i'm just going to say that with big quotation marks gobbles yeah. up as much inventory as they can but but no one has enough money to buy everything because there's so many watches out there i was i was i was just about to say that you know this whole myth about patek and the resale and all like all this sort of thing um it, what people don't realize and i found this from from mr stern from a couple of years ago he gave an interview to bloomberg and in there he said they make like 40 something thousand i think don't quote me on this but that was right about there and of course that must have gotten like higher these numbers don't you know go lower they go higher um because of economy of scale and so on so let's just say and i believe this to be a conservative number fifty thousand watches patek makes it makes every year that's a lot you know, that's, that's a lot. That's in 10 years, that's, that's half a million watches. And when you go on their site and you see that they have 197 different models, uh, that sort of, that is what should be like a, like a raised flag, you know, for people who say like, oh, but it's Patek and I can like sell it at auction. No, you cannot sell half a million watches on auction 50 years from now. You know, that's not how it works. So just because you get like a freaking gondola or you get a still ladies watch or whatever, uh, you are not part of that group. You are not part of the chosen, you know, just because you have one in 50,000. You know, what's exclusive in today's day and age, I think, is like 4,000, let's say. Because it's a big world and there's a lot of rich people who can throw a lot of money at watches. So, for example, Lange or Richard Mille or some of these brands who produce just a few thousand watches or Parmigiani even, they have other problems. But still, you know, like a f low few thousand uh, pieces produced in a year, that's where exclusiv uh, exclusivity is, not 197 different models. There's a lot of models out there, Patek Philippe. Look, it's crazy. That's a whole lot of round watches. And a whole lot of diamonds. I want me a gondola. I want me a gondola. You know what I think <laughs> we're going to do? This is what we're going to do. We're going to start just buying used women's watches. How do you feel about that? We're going to go small. Real small. I feel safe. My manliness has never been more safe than me wearing a 24. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're so, we're going to have great brands on our wrists. Yes. We're going to get amazing values. And you know what? We're probably going to get some diamonds, huh? How about that? I mean, I'll have me some diamonds. I genuinely do. Um, on that note, everyone... Thank you for listening to this episode of Spending Time. Thank you. This was a, this was a, this was a fun one when there weren't new watches to talk about. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll chat with you later. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.